Welcome to the SMU Video Archive. In this series, we interview members of the SMU community who can provide insight into the history of SMU, particularly for the perspective of their time at the university. I'm Jim Early, and we have with us today former Provost Neil McFarland. Neil, uh, you mentioned to me at one point that uh, as a young boy, you came to SMU to see the Shakespeare performance in front of Dallas Hall. Yes. Uh, I wondered what you could tell us in detail about that, so far as you remember it. I guess I don't remember many of the details, but I do remember the experience. Of course, it was a part of virtually a lifelong uh, interest in mm -hmm. SMU. But my parents brought me here for a performance of, uh, mm -hmm. of a play, which one I don't remember. But it was performed on the steps of Dallas Hall. Mary McCord, I now know, was responsible for that uh, particular program. But it uh, helped trigger for me, I think, in my later life, a long-standing interest in, in Shakespeare. <laughs> of course, um, I'm a native Dallasite, and so it's been my privilege to know about SMU and to have some relationship with SMU throughout most of my life, and that was one of the experiences that stands out in my memory. I don't remember what play it was, I don't remember how many of us there were, <laughs> but my recollection is that we were seated facing mm -hmm. Dallas Hall, and the play was performed mm -hmm. on the steps of Dallas Hall. I later learned also that there was an Arden Forest uh, between what is now the Perkins School of Theology and the Highland Park United Methodist Church. Neil, you, uh, your years at SMU as an undergraduate were broken by the war, and I've never known too much about your years as an SMU athlete, as a basketball player. Could you tell us a little <laughs> bit about your, your experience here, and then you went over to TCU? Right. Well, I entered uh, SMU in 1941 as a pre-theological mm -hmm. student. I had uh, played basketball uh, fairly successfully at Woodrow Wilson High School in Dallas and was a walk-on uh, for the program here at SMU. I came on a pre-theological scholarship and I remember very well that the tuition in those days was $150 a semester and I had a half scholarship. So that I had earned money during the summer working 30 cents an hour and I was able to pay <laughs> my tuition for that year. But of course in the middle of my freshman year uh, we had the Pearl Harbor attack in December of uh, 41. And that of course changed all of our lives and uh, those of us who were in college at the time knew that we possibly would be drawn into military service. I tried to uh, beat the draft by enrolling in what was called a Navy V-1 program, which was designed to uh, develop college students for eventual deck officers in the Navy. And we continued with our regular course of study, but we had to add to it certain courses in math and science. I remember well I was obliged to take a physics course that was primarily, <laughs> primarily designed for um, engineering students. That was, um, that was one of the tougher mm -hmm. academic enterprises of my life. We also had some special physical fitness program called pre-commando mm -hmm. pre uh, training. <laughs> well, that went on. Uh, I went through my sophomore mm -hmm. year as a, as a V1 member. And then they decided in the Navy that they couldn't wait for our mm -hmm. eventual graduation, so they mobilized us in what was called the Navy V-12 program. And I was sent to TCU. I have since described that as my being a casualty of war, <laughs> to my SMU friends at least. But it was a good fortune for me, of course. The intention was to stay there two semesters and then go to deck officer training. Well, in the meantime, they opened up um, a chaplain's training program in the Navy, parallel with the doctors and the dentist program. And if you'd been originally enrolled as a pre-theological student, you were eligible to apply for that. 
and that was my case. So I applied for that and um, didn't hear anything and finally orders came through for me to go to midshipman school at Asbury Park, New Jersey. And just a few days before I was due to leave, a telegram came yeah. countermanding uh -huh. that order and accepting me for the uh, chaplain's training program. So I was able to complete my degree in the summer then of 1944 and came back to uh, the School of Theology at SMU, which was one of the mm -hmm. chosen programs. At SMU as a freshman, I, had, uh, I was a walk-on in the basketball mm -hmm. program, and I played enough to get what was called then a freshman numeral. Freshman couldn't play varsity. In the second year, I was a squad man. But in going to um, TCU, I played varsity over there and got a varsity letter in, in, in basketball at TCU. But I stayed on in the School of Theology here uh, until the end of the war, as a matter of fact, so that I had very good fortune that I didn't have to go into, into combat. Uh, I was available. But one of the ironies was that they, they dressed us in um, in very spiffy uh, cadet uniforms with special mm -hmm. insignia. I was still rated as an apprentice seaman, and I think I must have been one of the longest tenured apprentice <laughs> seamen in the history of the Navy. <laughs> but uh, I would walk down the street in my cadet uniform mm -hmm. and sometimes get salutes from, <laughs> from enlisted men and who had no notion that I was the lowest ranking member of the armed services. But that was, of course, my good fortune. And um, I also then had the opportunity for the calendar year of 1946 to teach in the uh, religion department with the influx of veterans, of course. And I was a senior in the School of Theology, and they were desperate for help. And so I had my first experience in teaching in 1946, uh, teaching those veterans. And lo and behold, what should happen, but in one of my classes, one of the fellows that I had played against in high school basketball, he was at Sunset and I was at Woodrow Wilson. And then we were both at TCU mm -hmm. and played together, and here he showed up as a veteran in my class, and <laughs> that was one of the more daunting <laughs> challenges that I, that I had in my teaching career. Neil, could you tell us a little bit about your sense of SMU when you came back after graduate study in New York to Perkins? That was the period in which Merriman Cunningham was transforming yeah. that. Uh, Deckard Turner was be beginning the uh, Bridwell yeah. Library. It was really a great moment at SMU. Well, it really was. And when I was a senior in the um, School of Theology, we received that marvelous gift from the Perkins family, mm -hmm. and the school was renamed Perkins School of Theology. But of course, during the time that I was away, then they began the building mm -hmm. of Perkins School of Theology, um, the basic structures that, mm -hmm. uh, that now compose that quadrangle. I came back in 1954, and the School of Theology was an enormously exciting place to be at that particular time. Um, Merriman Cunningham, as you said, uh, had become dean. And he was a, a very enterprising man, a very sensible man. He was intent on building a strong mm -hmm. faculty. And he brought uh, such persons as Albert Outler. Uh, I name him, and there are many others that I could, yeah. could name also. But he was, the, he was the first star that was brought mm -hmm. into the mm -hmm. faculty. And that helped to attract other strong people. Mm -hmm. So that Merriman Cunningham built a very strong faculty. But he was not only concerned with building a strong faculty, he was very concerned about um, social realities. Mm -hmm. And well before the time of the uh, Supreme Court mm -hmm. decision uh, outlawing segregation, mm -hmm. he was in the process mm -hmm. of, um, of uh, integrating the School mm -hmm. of Theology. Mm -hmm. And he recruited very carefully, I believe it was nine black students. It wouldn't have done for any of them to fail, of course, at that particular time. He recruited them very carefully, and they were brought into the student body. And at the end of my first year, uh, that was in 1955, the first of these graduated. And so Perkins, under 
Cunningham's leadership became um, a real leader in the integration mm -hmm. of the so Society of mm -hmm. Dallas mm -hmm. and, uh, and the Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. Well, you served as a member of the Perkins faculty, and then at one point you were tapped to become, I guess, the third provost after Bill Ayer's somewhat unfortunate brief tenure as provost. Yes. Uh, Willis brought you in, and uh, could you tell us a little bit about your experience as provost? <laughs> Well, this was one of the more exciting but also unanticipated <laughs> <laughs> developments in my whole career. Uh, in the summer of 1966, July 1, as a matter of fact, I became the associate uh, dean of the School of Theology. And Joe Quillian asked me to come in and kind of preside over the internal affairs of the seminary while he dealt with mm -hmm. the external affairs. Well, I'd been in that position only t two months or two and a half months um, when Joe Quillian came to me and, uh, uh, Dusty uh, Cunningham, Joe Quillian was yeah, the dean at that yeah. time. Joe Quillian came to me and he said, uh, Willis Tate wants you to consider becoming acting provost, as we <laughs> called it in those right. days, now provost, of the university. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know what he was talking <laughs> about, you see. Well, he told me that uh, Bill Ayers, because of health reasons, mm -hmm. was having to step out uh. and that Willis was uh, desperate for help. And that he had talked with uh, Joe Quillian about the problem and Joe said, well, you need somebody like Neil. <laughs> and Willis said, well, how about Neil? <laughs> So the first thing I knew, uh, Willis Tate was asking me to come and talk to him, and I met him in his office on a Sunday afternoon. And he made the proposal to me that I become the acting provost. Well, my first question to him is, What's, <laughs> what is the provost? <laughs> and he replied, uh, he's the dean of deans. Well, that had sort of a messianic ring to it, I suppose. <laughs> dean of Dean, Lord of Lords or something. King of Kings. But I thought it over a few, few days and discussed it with some colleagues and finally accepted it, but expecting that I would be in that position only uh, a short period of time. As it turned out, uh, in January, I guess, of that uh, following year, of that later in that year, I was asked to accept the position and then in the spring, I was made uh, vice president and, uh, and provost. And I stayed on then through 1972. Well, the 1960s were not exactly the ideal time for a person with no administrative <laughs> experience other than three months as a, an associate dean to, to tackle these problems. It was a very challenging time. Of course, we this was the period in which uh, we had a good deal of student mm -hmm. demonstrations of one sort or another. And uh, while we didn't have as major problems as many other schools, we got a taste of nearly everything that was happening on university mm -hmm. campuses in those days. We had one advantage, though. I've often thought about this since then. We had about a six-week lead time on all of the issues. <laughs> They would surface on the University of California mm -hmm. campus at Berkeley, mm -hmm. usually. All the issues, all the terminology would be worked mm -hmm. out at that particular time. Then the movement would come across the country, hit Chicago, move over and just clobber Columbia University, mm -hmm. and then filter mm -hmm. down to us. Well, by the time it got to us, uh, we did know the mm -hmm. issues, we did know the terminology. Mm -hmm. And most of the people who were picking up on these things locally were just parroting <laughs> the issues yeah. and the terminology. So we had some preparation. But nevertheless, uh, we had some sleepless nights and, uh, and some difficult times. But when you ask about my experiences there as, as provost, I have to think also of my experience with the racehorse deans. To talk of the provost as the dean of deans was <laughs> uh, it was a little bit of an exaggeration, I think. We Can had you explain what you mean by racehorse. Racehorse dean. deans. Yeah, this was a term, as a matter of fact, that uh, President Willis Tate applied to three of um, of our deans. <laughs> 
very bright, yeah. competent yeah. people, but in a hurry. <laughs> There was uh, Kermit Hunter in the School of the Arts, there was Jack Grayson in the Business School, and Tom Martin in the Engineering School. And each of these men was in a hurry to get somewhere, but some of the rest of us didn't quite understand where that somewhere <laughs> was. And so um, it, was, it was my task usually to, uh, to deal with these particular deans in their effort to move ahead. I, of course, had a great deal of sympathy mm -hmm. for their goals, mm -hmm. but sometimes reaching those goals was just not fis fiscally mm -hmm. possible, and I hesitate to say this, but none of those men hesitated at all to spend money that wasn't mm -hmm. there. <laughs> well, another aspect of it wasn't it that they had some fairly important trustee backers that uh, primarily felt their school ought to get what was there and yes. hell with the rest of it. As, as a matter of fact, there was an effort made to form a foundation mm -hmm. on behalf of mm -hmm. each of the schools of the university. Now, it worked partly in the case of these three schools that I just mentioned, arts, um, business, and um, engineering. But the trustees who were part of that backing group also insinuated themselves pretty fully mm -hmm. into the decision-making processes mm -hmm. of the university. And that became a, a major mm -hmm. problem for me and for many others, for that matter, uh, particularly in view of the fact that those foundations never did produce much in the way mm -hmm. of uh, financial support. I make one exception there. Alger Meadows mm -hmm. uh, was, was not of that mm -hmm. ilk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, uh, he gave his money and uh, he pretty well left others to decide how it would be how it would be spent. And he really gave quite a lot of money. He gave quite a lot of money and some of the others didn't. <laughs> they, they talked big but didn't come through. Yeah. But I look back on those years with, uh, with mixed feelings. It was a hard time, a very hard time. But nevertheless, it gave me an opportunity to um, understand the university as I never could have understood it before. It was possible for me, for example, to know nearly every faculty member on campus. Usually I interviewed all of the incoming faculty as part of the process of, of approval. And I came to appreciate uh, much more deeply than I ever could have otherwise uh, the importance of a well-balanced mm -hmm. university. Mm -hmm. I often wished that there could be more interaction mm -hmm. between the various schools. I was disturbed by the fact that uh, each one seemed to be going its own mm -hmm. separate way and in so many instances there were overlapping areas mm -hmm. of interest that could have been uh, more fully exploited than, mm -hmm. than they were. And I think that remains a problem in the university. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not now a part, active part of the university and certainly not a part of the administration. But um, that's been, I think, a, a difficulty that academia has faced for a long time. Well, I remember the deep humanity of one Neil McFarland when I went to see you about recruiting of someone I'd known at Yale who was at San Francisco State and caught in the terrible tor turmoil out there. And I had to tell you up front that he had been caught in the rather embarrassing sex scandal at Smith College before that, and uh, you essentially gave me the green light despite knowing this to go out, and he finally got rather cold feet about coming to Dallas in those days and uh, <laughs> stayed at San Francisco State, but I always appreciated that kind of breadth of human feeling that you had. Uh, when much of this institution would not have come to the same <laughs> view of things. Neil, one other thing. You served as provost uh, through Willis's uh, first yes. term and in, into Paul Hardin's term. Is there anything you'd like to speak about that transition, your sense of Paul as an incoming president or anything of that sort? Well, I was a part of the group that uh, sought uh, Paul and invited him here. and. Uh, I felt it was a very strong appointment. But he came in um, 72, I guess it was, and I had been in the, in the job um, since uh, 
66, mm -hmm. and uh, it was sort of wearing out. In the meantime, I'd also lost my wife in 1971, lost her to cancer, and that took a, a real toll on me. So I was about ready to, to step out. But I felt that I ought to stay on until the new president mm -hmm. came in, just to help him get mm -hmm. his feet on the ground. And I'm glad I did. Uh, Paul was a delightful fellow. Mm -hmm. And my current wife was his secretary, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact. Uh, and so I stayed on through uh, the remainder of that year in, uh, in Paul Hardin's administration mm -hmm. and stepped out at the end of 1972. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, um, subsequently, um, Paul was asked to, to mm. resign, and uh, I was brought back into some of that uh, negotiation, uh, representing the faculty in this instance, and trying to uh, find out just mm. how this had taken mm. place, because it seemed to many of us on the faculty mm. that this was very high-handed mm. and mm. very ill-advised. Um, Perhaps Paul Hardin at that time was, uh, was young and uh, perhaps not too careful in some of the things that he said or did. But later on he became president of Drew University and then the chancellor of the, uh, of the uh, North Carolina mm -hmm. <laughs> educational system. So we lost a good opportunity. Ultimately he proved himself. <laughs> we lost a good opportunity to develop um, strong leadership in our own school. Mm -hmm. Neil, uh, you are professor of the history of religions with a particular interest in Japan, and I know that you've spent a deal of your imagination, your energy, your travel time, uh, yes. forging links between SMU and Japan, between the United States and Japan. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that, that portion of your life? Yes, of course, this is, this is one of the most exciting <laughs> developments mm -hmm. in my life, um, and it came about as so many things do unexpectedly. In my second year on the faculty, this would have been 1955-56, a Japanese graduate student came to Perkins School of Theology wanting to study history of religions. Well, I was the only person in the history of religions, and so he, of course, was assigned to me in a master's degree program. Well. We were not only teacher and student, we became very fast friends. He was only a year younger than I. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a fairly fascinating story, which I haven't really time to go into in detail here, but uh, Sakai Kobayashi was his name, and uh, he had ended up the war as a volunteer for the kamikaze flights. And on the, he, he had uh, been trained as a pilot, but had developed tuberculosis and so spent most of the war years in a sanitarium and came out just in time to be reactivated during the latter days of the war when things were going very badly for Japan. And he volunteered, thinking that he had really failed his country, he volunteered for the Kamikaze Corps. Well, on the very day that the war ended, he, his squadron was called out to intercept reported American bombers. And he went to his, uh, his plane thinking that he was going to his death, and it's a very dramatic story that he had to tell. Well, while they were warming up their planes, the all clear came through, and this was a mistake, and so he came back, and that day the emperor came on to, for the people to hear for the first time on radio, the Japanese decision to surrender. <coughs> well, as an officer in the, in the, in the uh, military, he was not eligible for most jobs. He had a hard time. Finally, he ended up at Kansei Gakuin University in the School of Theology mm -hmm. there. He was a very apt student. They wanted to retain him as a professor, but they didn't need a person. His field was uh, Old Testament. They didn't need another person in Old Testament. But they did need someone in history of religions, and so they asked him if he would go and prepare in that field. Well. His first step was to come to me, and that was my extremely That's good fortune, because I learned a whole lot from him, as I hope he learned mm -hmm. something from me, but he had also come with the instruction to be on the alert for some young professor who could come as a visiting mm -hmm. professor to Kansei mm -hmm. Gakuin. Mm -hmm. 
in the field of history of religions. Mm -hmm. And so um, Kobayashi-san uh, wrote back to his president mm -hmm. that he thought I might be that person. And sure enough, I was invited mm -hmm. to come with my family. And uh, so we went as a family of five in 1956 for that academic mm -hmm. year to Kansai Gakuin mm -hmm. University. It had originated as a, as a Methodist mm -hmm. school, but at the time that I was there, it was, uh, it was a, a part of the, what they call the United Church of Christ in Japan. But we had a marvelous year there. My friend Sakai Kobayashi had gone on to Union Theological Seminary mm -hmm. for that year, so he was not there at that time. But Bill Bray, who was um, an early graduate, 1930s graduate, I guess, of SMU, was on the faculty. And Tadao Agura, who was a 1920s graduate, was on the faculty. And the two of them uh, were very interested, along with me, in developing some kind of a closer relationship between Kansai Gakuin and SMU. Well, that was some years in materializing. Um, actually, I formed some research interest there and began some Japanese language study. Never enough, but some Japanese language study and went back in 1963-64. And then we got pretty serious about developing some kind of a sister school relation between SMU and Kansai Gakuin. But while I was in the, in the I'll call it provost job now, since that's the current term, <coughs> the opportunity came for me to uh, introduce this possibility. It was looked upon favorably by uh, our administrative committee. It was later actually f completely finalized by um, uh, President Zumberg. But we developed in the early 70s this um, exchange program, first of all, faculty exchange, occasional mm -hmm. faculty exchange. And then about 1980, or late 70s, uh, we began a student exchange. And Professor Glenn Linden stepped into the picture and mm -hmm. became one of the driving forces in organizing mm -hmm. that student exchange. And we've now had um, uh, close to 20 years of student mm -hmm. exchange between these two schools. But out of my uh, experience in Japan also, um, my experience and my wife's experience, uh, we became very interested in, in developing closer relationships within Dallas of the few Japanese who lived here at that time and the few Americans who'd had some experience there. And so she and I together in 1970 organized the Japan America Society of Dallas. Unfortunately, she died 16 months later mm -hmm. than that, but the society continues and mm -hmm. we just recently celebrated our 30th mm -hmm. anniversary. Uh, about five and a half years ago, we expanded also to Fort Worth. We're now the Jap Japan America Society of Dallas Fort right. Worth. So through these years, um, that society has contributed a good deal toward bringing together into mm -hmm. social mm -hmm. relationships, first of all, uh, Japanese and Americans, mm -hmm. a cultural exchange, but now, more recently also, the business relationships, mm -hmm. of course, have become important ones. Mm -hmm. And I still am active in that uh, society. Mm -hmm. And my daughter is currently the executive director of the Japan American Society of Dallas-Fort Worth. Neil, more or less, uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, but in regard to uh, kind of a summary view of things, uh, could you kind of Give us an overall sense of your, your view of what's happened to SMU, its changes overall since you first arrived as a student, <laughs> and uh, your present emeritus sense of things. Well, of course, the changes have been enormous. And um, of course, I, I think back also even to my childhood mm -hmm. days when SMU was said to be in a Johnson grass field <laughs> <laughs> and was uh, reachable by a, a streetcar uh -huh. it was called the Green Dragon. <laughs> uh, when I first came here there were only a few buildings on the campus and of course just in terms of, of buildings alone the change has just been enormous and that goes on as we now know as we try to find parking places or maneuver around the university in our cars. But the, the university has, uh, has progressed enormously and I think has a great future. I'm 
certainly much encouraged by the leadership that President Turner is giving at the present time in developing closer relationships between the university and the and the city and in uh, developing a financial campaign that appears to be proceeding very successfully. This is the first, so far as I can remember, the first major financial campaign that actually has been undertaken and <laughs> carried through. And, and, carried through. <clears throat> and this, bodes, this bodes well, I yeah. think, for the university. But of course, the university is not just its buildings mm -hmm. and uh, its um, projects. Um, the university depends on a great deal, and I'm sure that there is great progress mm -hmm. being made here, too. The one thing that I have hoped for for many years is that the university would be more fully accepted by the city of Dallas. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that hinges partly on the university's willingness to accept the city of Dallas. I think that um, we do not have as close a relationship, or as trusting a relationship, as dependent a relationship as I, I wish we might have. How do you accomplish that? Well, of course, the, the leadership of the president is important, and I think Willis Tate did a good job in, in developing that kind of relationship, and I think uh, President Turner is doing a good job. But it also depends a great deal on the, on the faculty. It's so easy for faculty members to sort of crawl into their own little insisted mm -hmm. world perhaps not realizing how much they could contribute to the surrounding community in the development of its citizenry. And uh, I wish we had more faculty involvement in the life of the city. Uh, Dallas is now, in many respects, correctly identified as an international city. That is, it has all the trappings of an international city, a great international airport, headquarters for many international companies, mm -hmm. an enormously diverse and growing mm -hmm. international population mm -hmm. here. The demographics mm -hmm. of Dallas are just unimaginable mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. earlier days here. We thought of all those people as being over there, and now, <laughs> now many of them are here, you see. But while we have many of the trappings of an international city, I'm not sure that attitudinally we have developed to that point, to really being a really qualifying as an international city. And this university could contribute so much to helping to elevate that attitude and that awareness. And I hope that as the days unfold that the university will play a more and more important role in helping to, um, shall I say, develop the sophistication mm -hmm. <laughs> of, the, of the city of Dallas. Well, is there anything else that uh, we need to, uh, uh, to give we'll, our attention to here? Uh, I think we've perhaps covered a number of interesting topics. And, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, Neil. I appreciate the opportunity of sharing these moments with you. Uh, uh, we see each other most frequently on the tennis court and have for 30 years yes. or more. But it's pleasant to sit yeah. down and discuss these uh, matters that we have a common interest in.